And uh, we're not going to probably get through the whole thing today, of course, but uh, I thought we'd get a good start on it. I don't want to keep you late today. But it says uh, in my opening paragraph, God calls these laws judgments. These laws will keep the way of peace and justice before the people. And it's as well for us, it's a healthy reminder of our daily need for mercy uh, because we fail a lot. And so law is what it does. It brings uh, the reality to your mind that, you know, I'm not as good as I think I am. If you have no law, then you think you're pretty good, <laughs> you know. <laughs> like people say, oh, my children, they, they're just really good. Do you have any rules? <laughs> Because the rules are what reveal the heart. Uh, you know, there's no rebellion without rules. And you only find out if you've got rebels if there's actually rules. And when the rules are disobeyed and they're not adhered to or they're disdained in some way, then you know there's a heart problem in your family. And so that's what reveals it. And so rules are a good thing to have. We all got to have rules. We don't live life, oh, we don't need rules. Everybody just chooses. Well, then you'll never know what your heart is. Because those rules reveal your heart. Amen. And so this is the, in the same way. People would uh, have these laws being given. And uh, how they apply these laws is going to reveal really where the heart, heart is. So in Deuteronomy 5.32 it says, You shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God hath commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you. That you may live and that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. And so once again, he's talking about the promised land. He's talking about the will of God for your life. And so what the Lord is doing to, the, to, these, uh, to Israel in the wilderness, saying, I'm giving you these laws, because when you get into that land, I don't want you to be a, 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 you know, a, a flash in the pan type of uh, you know, situation. I want you to have longevity. I want you to be able to use you until Jesus comes. Amen. Now we know that didn't work because they disobeyed the laws. And they had to take, be taken out of the land. But really the, the laws were there to keep them focused so they could be a better testimony to the world and they could reach the Gentiles and so forth. That was God's plan. And so that's why he's saying don't turn from the right to the left. That it may be well with you. That it may prolong your days in the land which you possess. And many times I was reading through some of these laws and I thought, you know, many times I hear people saying, oh yeah, that guy, you know, I don't know why he did that way. And really the principle is addressed there in the civil law of how these people just flippantly make a decision, well, we don't have to do that. And yet it, yet it reflects your character. It reflects what kind of person you are. And God knew that. And so thousands of years ago, he wrote these principles that today they'd be very important to, to, for us to, to take notice of and implement in our life because it would it would show people that you've got character, you know, and it gives a very good testimony of of the Lord in your life when you can live by principle instead of by pressure and situations and emotion and so forth. And so these laws were given to Moses. And remember, I gave you that sheet of the different ascensions up the Mount Sinai. And so so the interesting thing with the passages here in Exodus chapter. 19 all the way through to chapter 24 is you've got to learn to place what he's saying in the right time period because he'll he'll give you the the whole chronology of what happened and then he'll show you what happened back halfway down and so it can confuse you if you don't if you don't read it right if you don't study to say okay now where where is he saying this and so basically these laws were actually given to Moses on the fifth ascent to Sinai he already knew this before he got the tablets. And, um, and so the Lord wanted to speak to the people before his sixth as, as, uh, ascent to Mount Sinai to receive the stone tablets. So they already had the civil law delivered to them before he got the tablets. And so that's why, you know, you watch the movie and that's not the way it goes. <laughs> you know, Charlton Heston, he does not accurately, you know, in fact, that movie, there's so many things that are not scriptural, it's not even funny. I haven't seen it for probably you know 20 years, but I still remember some of those, hey, that doesn't fit there, and that's not supposed to be there, but it makes for a good movie, you know? But anyways, and so uh, on the fifth ascent, and it's basically when Moses went to talk to the Lord, he came back down, 
And then God told him and the 70 elders to come partially up the mountain and they fellowship there. At that point, he had the law. And then what he did is he went back down to, to build an altar and then he ratified the covenant before the people. After he ratified the covenant, that's when he went back up to get the stone tablets. So they, it had already been ratified. It already, the blood had already been spink, sprinkled. And then he went up to get the stone tablets. And by the time he got back, they were in heavy apostasy. That's how quickly they turned on their, we'll do everything you say, Lord. <laughs> you know, they really messed up. And so Exodus 23, 24, um, verse 3, it says, And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord hath said will we do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and built an altar under the hill and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's kind of the setting that we're looking at in relation to, this, to these laws that we're looking at today. And I just say that to give you kind of the, the atmosphere of where, where this all took place. And now we're going to get into the principles and we're not dealing with any of that. All right, it's just talking straight laws and principles and so forth. But I wanted you to kind of get that in your mind as we, before we do this. So number one, and we're going to go to Exodus chapter 21 and just kind of hop through these passages here. I can't cover them all. There's a lot that they say in here. And some of it, you know, not too many of you have an ox that gores people and stuff like that. So we're not going to go through everything. Uh, but uh, some of these things are very interesting and I want to look at them. So number one is the master and servant relationship. So slavery, you hear a lot about that today. Um, because of slavery existed in the past, now everybody's got to pay everybody off and you, know, you owe me and you owe me. Folks, the whole society in the ancient times was based on slavery. Yeah. Slavery was everywhere. It was throughout the whole globe. It was actually a way of life. But it's a lot different than the way that people in their minds think that slavery is today. All they think of today is if it's slavery, someone is whipping you and, uh, and that's what slavery was. But that's not, as a whole, what slavery actually was. It really was a master and servant relationship. And it was, it was, very, uh, it was very dictatorial, that's for sure. He, they dictated, but at the same time, there was a lot of choice involved. And that we have to understand here. Not all the time, but there is. And so uh, one way of slavery would be when a nation would conquer another nation and they would make the uh, citizens or the conquered, they'd make them slaves to the victors. And you'd say, hey, fair, <laughs> you lost, you know, especially if you started the fight. But isn't that what uh, Goliath said when he was fighting? And he says, hey, you send me one man that can beat me. And if he beats me, we'll be your slaves. Otherwise, you be our slaves. And so that's the way it worked. And so wars and, and that day, that's the way it happened. When you lost all the way up Alexander the Great, uh, way up to the world empires, they all operated that way. Even the Roman Empire operated that way. So if you want to have reparations for slavery, you can basically, you give me your money, then I'd have to give someone else the money. Because we've all been involved in slavery. Our ancestors have been slavers, and we've been enslaved. Because <laughs> that's just ancient world, all right? And so nowadays, people are just so off base in their understanding. It, it really is a mess. And we're just trying to, we're trying to stroke offended people, and they don't ever acquiesce. They, they're implacable, like the Bible says. Implacable, they just cannot be satisfied. And so you're wasting your time trying to satisfy an implacable person, a person that will not be satisfied. You can give them a million dollars a day, and they'll still complain. Because offenses cannot be dealt with with money. Yeah. Amen? That's a, that's a problem in your heart. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And so another way slavery was common was that those that were poor were given housing, food, and a way to survive if they made themselves slaves to a master. And so they would make a choice. Otherwise, their family would die. They didn't have welfare. They didn't have, 
these programs. They would have to get food off the streets or, you know, kill something. And if there's no food uh, in the forest to kill, you're just going to die, <laughs> you know. Look at the, the widow, even in the biblical days with Elijah. She had no food. She had a little bit of meal left, and she was just prepared to die. See, at that point, what would happen is she would take her son and say, you go to that rich man over there, and you commit yourself to him. That way he will take care of us. So they've actually, by, on purpose, they made themselves slaves to the master. But with any slave-master relationship, there's good masters and there's bad masters, amen? And so just because there's bad masters doesn't mean that all of them were bad. But all of them, some of them would take very seriously the care that they had for their slaves. And we, that's hard to get our minds around that because all we think about is someone tied to a post and being whipped. And, but that's not at all how it always was. Amen? And that's why the scripture has a certain perspective of it as well. The Apostle Paul, when he was giving the doctrine of the New Testament, he didn't tell the slaves or even the masters that God saved, let all your slaves go. Not once do you find that in scripture. So now people will say, oh, the Bible is, in for, is for slavery and they're attacking God because uh, the Bible doesn't outlaw slavery, you know. Uh, but what he's talking about is something far greater than just a master-servant relationship. He's talking about being used of God in your situation to reach people. Look at the Apostle Paul. What happened to him? He purposely, where he could have escaped it, he purposely was placed in prison in Rome, knowing that he was probably going to die there, when he could have probably got out of it several times. All he had to say is the right thing, and he could have left. He could have just walked right out of the jail. But he didn't. So Paul had the mentality, your problem isn't that you're a slave. Your problem is, is you don't know how to use being a slave for the Lord. Amen. And that's what we see here in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, in verse 20, it says, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Art thou called being a servant? That means, did the Lord find you and you got saved while you were being a servant underneath your master? He says, care not for it. But if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. So he says, don't, don't be anxious over it. Don't, don't think that's what it's all about now, that i got to get free. In fact, wasn't it uh, Philemon... Uh, the book of Philemon was written to a master in, re in relation to a slave that ran away. And Paul met that slave in the prison, <laughs> led him to the Lord, and then wrote a letter to Philemon in Colossae and said, hey, take him back. Yep. Amen. Except don't treat him like a slave, treat him like a brother. Yeah. But in the same servant-master relationship, because he shouldn't have just taken off on you. He had an obligation that he was supposed to fulfill. You see that? And so, so the, the, the Bible, it's not endorsing whipping people. <laughs> you know, there's laws about that, and there's God's mind about loving people and being kind. But he's not necessarily saying that every master-servant relationship should have been dissolved just because they got saved. Because it's all evil. People survive that way. Poor people were fed. Poor people got a, a home a roof over their head because someone was taking care of them and they had to obligate themselves. But the Lord had laws in relation to that and it wasn't just a carte blanche, you hear your, now you got a slave, you can do whatever you want with them. The Lord had a way of dealing with slaves which was very fair. And so, um, where am I here? I don't think I, I finished reading this. It says, for he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Think about that. So if all you can do is in your mindset say, oh, I'm just a servant, I can't do anything. He says, no, you're not. You may be a servant, but you're the Lord's free man. That you're still at liberty in your soul. Nobody's controlling your heart. Nobody's controlling your prayer. Nobody's controlling your thoughts. You know? And so he says, you're free even though you're a slave. <laughs> you know? So he says, um, Likewise, also, he that is called being free is Christ's servant. And so, any way you look at it, guys, you're a servant. If you've got a master on earth, or if you're free from a master on earth, you are still got a master in heaven. 
you're still a servant. <laughs> you know, there is no, I can do what I want around here. That is a wrong mentality for God's people. You can't just say, I'm in charge of my own life and nobody tells me what to do. No, absolutely someone tells you what to do. And if you've got any questions about that, you wait till the millennial kingdom and you'll find out who the boss really is. Yeah. Yeah. But you're going to like him. Amen? You're going to like him as boss because he cares about you like a good master would. Amen? So what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to turn your mind against a master-servant relationship when in all reality, that's not what we need to turn our mind against. We need to turn our mind against perhaps being uh, violent, being evil towards people. But I'll tell you something, there's many masters that treated their slaves like their own family. And you see that throughout the scripture, amen? Where if they wouldn't have taken care of them, those folks would have had nothing to eat. They would have had no purpose, you see. And so there's no problem with a master-servant relationship, but there is a problem with bad masters, <laughs> amen, and bad servants, <laughs> all right? Same thing. So it goes on to say, you are bought with a price, be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he was called, therein abide with God. So basically it's like this. Um, the Lord doesn't want you to label yourself as a servant of man. Even if you are a servant of man. That's why he says to the wife in the home, uh, obey your husband as unto the Lord. Yeah. See, you should never obey your husband because you, you feel you're a slave to your husband. But you should obey your husband because you're a slave to God. Yeah. You're a servant to God. Uh, that's the same way it talks about children, as unto the Lord. Servants, obey your masters, as unto the Lord. You see, it, it, so that would keep you completely away from rebellion in your life. And it would keep you away from this labeling that somehow I'm less than my husband. Or no, we're all less than God. We're all servants of the Lord. We all have to live under that servitude and he places us in his structure where he wants us and all of us have someone over us, amen? And we need to understand that. A lot of ladies say, well, my husband, he, he doesn't need to obey anybody. He needs to obey the king of kings. Yeah. And you think that's easier. Kids, they look at their parents and say, oh yeah, you're the boss of home. I can hardly wait till I call the shots. No, see, your mom and dad are gonna answer to Jesus Christ. Do you understand? It's not about just doing what you want in the home. In fact, you, a, a child has a far easier situation than a mother or father do. And just because a mother or father aren't taking seriously the authority in their life of Christ in their life does not mean they're not going to be called into account over it. Because there's always a head over us. <laughs> the Bible says that every man, the head of every man is Christ. And that's why we take seriously what we do in our homes. We don't just let things happen. A little pressure from the wife or the children, we just give in. <laughs> no, sir. You have to hold your ground, man, because you have got an accountability to God himself. You will not be facing your wife one day at the, at the great white, th at, the, at the throne of God, not the great white, hopefully not, <laughs> at the throne of God. You, you won't be facing your wife. You won't be facing your kids. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. Your kids and your wife, if they got you to turn away from the Lord, in that day, they're going to be weeping on their face before God, realizing how wicked they have been in making you face God that way. I remember I was talking to some youth. I was telling them this. You just remember, every bit of pressure you put on your mom and dad to give in to your own fleshly desires one day you will stand there watching God deal with your mom and dad about the things that you put pressure on them about. <laughs> now, if that doesn't get you right, <laughs> nothing's going to get you right because that takes faith. You have to believe this is true, you know? But it is true. It is true. And so uh, think about that. When it comes down to the end, there is an accounting. How many times did he have to tell us in the New Testament that he's coming back to, 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 to uh, judge the stewards and to make sure they did well with the talents they were given and so forth? And he would be pretty severe. He would say, you thou wicked servant. Threw him out where there's uh, utter darkness and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> you know, wow. Say, my goodness. 
This isn't a mamby pamby long haired Jesus. This is a this is a a God that demands obedience to him. But he wants you to do it by faith so he can reward you. Amen. It's so important we see this. And so this first section here in Exodus 21 verse 2 it says, "If thou buy an Hebrew servant, 6 years he shall serve and in the 7th he shall go out free for nothing. And if he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. And his master hath given him a wife. So some masters would actually give a wife to their slave. It says, um, where am I here? I lost my... And she hath borne him sons and daughters. The wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my, my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, he shall also bring him to the door and unto the doorposts, and his master shall bore his ear with, through, with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. And if a man sell his... Well, let's go through that first. So letter A, a servant pictures a sinner in bondage to sin. So you are in bondage. You have to be there. And the Bible talks about that in Romans seven fourteen, And we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So I'm in a place I cannot be free. I'm locked in. I'm locked into this relationship and I can't get out. Romans 6 20. For when ye were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Or John 8 34, Jesus answering them, uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Okay? So this is a picture of how a servant is a servant to sin. But the Lord doesn't want you to stay there. So he provides a way out. So letter B, a servant set free by the master is a picture of salvation through Christ. So notice that on the seventh year, he says you're going to have to let him go. So no matter what he owed, no matter what he committed, <clears throat> you by law now are going to release every servant on the seventh year. Isn't that something? So that's not like whip, you know. I mean, that's letting him go, free, all right? Uh, letter C, a servant that loves his master could choose to serve him willingly after he is freed. This pictures the believer's freedom to choose to serve the Lord after salvation. See, <clears throat> I was thinking about a guy that has been kind of going around giving some problems to preachers, sending emails websites the whole kit and caboodle you know attacking every guy that doesn't believe with his message believe his message and his message is this that once you're saved you're automatically a servant and if you're not serving him and you're having problems with sin then you really didn't get saved okay now i know something about guys like this that number one they've never pastored people <laughs> because if they would pastor people they'd know that they're in fairy tale land here when a person gets saved, they do struggle with sin. They do battle through habitual things. I did it myself. Didn't mean that I wasn't saved. I was saved, but I, you gotta, you got to remember, it's all about bringing your mind to a place of your position. My position is in Christ, but it doesn't mean the rest of me is. <laughs> you know, There's three parts of me. The first part is completely sealed at the day of redemption. It's 100% uh, where it ought to be. The second part of me, my soul, has a long way to go. I've been filled full of garbage from my youth, and little by little, say the sanctification process, truth has to come in, and as I make a choice to kick out the lie, the lie gets kicked out, the truth gets put in, and that's a day-by-day -day process until Jesus comes. And so as you work through things, then you become enabled to make better decisions and to surrender yourself and to become more consecrated to the things of the Lord. Amen? That's why the Bible says, be holy in all manner of conversation. So that means that uh, every aspect of your lifestyle <clears throat> ultimately should be brought under consecration to God. Um, holiness doesn't mean you're free from defilement or free from sin, <laughs> you know, because everybody here is going to have sin until Jesus comes. What holiness is, is you, it is something that is set apart to God. And in that process of being set apart, 
it becomes cleansed. Do you understand? See, that's why the tabernacle furniture, the little ladles and the pans and things like that, the Bible says they shall be holy unto the Lord. Well, how does a pan get holy, <laughs> you know? Well, that's because the pan is dedicated completely to the Lord's purpose. That's what holiness is, you see. So if I'm not dedicating my life or my lifestyle to the Lord, whether it's my work, uh, family life, whatever it is, if there's something I'm holding back, there's a part of my life that isn't holy as unto the Lord. And I'm not fully consecrated, you see. And the only way I'm going to do that is if I finally recognize that I'm not consecrated and there are issues in my life, and then I surrender that, you see. See, that's why this point is so important. Servant that loves his master and has, you know, uh, could choose to serve that master willingly after he was freed. So Jesus, he, he redeemed you, he bought you, he set you free from the bondage of sin. But you know what he didn't do? Put his own chains on you. He unlocked the chains of sin. He unlocked the chains of death. But then he didn't just throw those chains down and grab his chain while you're on the slave block put it on, then drag you home. He, he broke the chains off, and he left you there. And then he walked away. Isn't that how Jesus is? Remember when they were out on the ocean there, and the storm and so forth, and Jesus was walking on the water, and the Bible says that he walked as though he was going to walk right on by. He's not there. To, he's, I'm not here to make you do anything. <laughs> but if you want to call to me, I'm here. You want to follow me, I'm here. And that's why he went to the disciples, just follow me and I'll make you to become fishers of men. He didn't force anybody to do that. He didn't force any, Peter to throw down his nets and say, I'm done with fishing. That was a decision Peter made. <laughs> because he was set free of his sin, his chains had been taken off. He says, you know what? I'm going to purposely choose this as my master in life. That's the picture we have here. And that's a picture every one of us need to make. That's a decision everyone needs to make here in this room. Um, that's why Joshua said in Joshua 24, 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Well, I mean, didn't the Lord bring you out of Egypt? Didn't, wasn't the blood already plied? Didn't he already feed you in the wilderness? Didn't he already take care of you and give you all these things and show you how great he was? Aren't you already in the promised land and you saw all the victories and so forth? And now you're telling me, Joshua, to choose who I'm going to serve? Isn't that something? Well, according to the guy that's given us a hard time, that because they were let free in Egypt, they would have had no choice. They'd have been serving all along, but no, they didn't, right? That's why in Romans 12, first verse, I beseech you therefore, brethren, I beg you, brothers, children of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Yeah. That's what that means, a living sacrifice, a living slave to God. That's why Paul, when he, when he was uh, talking about himself and what he was going to, he never said, oh, I'm a prisoner of Rome and that Caesar, he's got me as a prisoner and he's belly aching about it. He would always say, I'm a prisoner of what? Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. He would never give credit to the world for anything that he was brought into servitude to. He says, I am not a servant to Rome. I'm not a servant to Caesar. I'm a servant to Christ. I'm not a prisoner to Rome. I'm not a prisoner to Caesar because I, then I could have left. See, many of us, that's the way we live. We live like we're prisoners of Caesar. And that's why whenever you get the first time to get out, you get out. Whenever Caesar gives you the open door, you take the open door. That's why many people that were given the chance to either renounce Christ or not, they would renounce. Because they weren't servants of Christ. <laughs> they identified with the being a prisoner of the world. But if you can change your mindset and say, hey... <laughs> If I'm in prison because of the life I'm living for the Lord, I'm not a prisoner of Alberta. I'm a prisoner of Christ. Now, nobody else may recognize that, but it doesn't really matter. That's my freedom. That's why he says, care not for it. You are the Lord's freeman. Amen? 
Look at the Apostle Paul. Did he not on purpose get placed into the prison there in Philippi? He knew what was going to happen when he cast that demon out of that girl. (laughs) That's why he delayed. (laughs) She followed him around for days. (laughs) He was just, oh. He knew when he cast out that that he was going to stir something up and he was going to get in trouble. Finally, he just said, okay, I've had enough. Get out of her. And sure enough, all the merchants got mad because now their demonic woman couldn't make her money, make the money anymore. Sure enough, straight to prison, <laughs> you know. But I'll tell you something, Paul was the freest man in that prison. <laughs> he was more free than the jailer that held the key. Wow. Isn't that true? Because when it came down to it and the, and the earthquake came and all the doors were opened, oh, I'm a, sur- uh, I'm a prisoner of, of Philippi. Well, if the doors would open, then you'd run. But he wasn't a prisoner of Philippi. He was a prisoner of Christ. So the bars had nothing to do with it. He was there for the jailer. And in that moment, the jailer was ready to kill himself because he was a prisoner. And Paul says, don't do that. (laughs) Let's make you free. Amen. He got free. He became one of, the, one of the original members of the church at Philippi. Think about that. Later on, he'd go to church with his family, just like you sitting there. He was the one that cast him into the prison, whipped him, whipped him and put him in stocks. Yet yeah, now he's the best church member in the church. Amen. Amen. Along with Lydia, the seller of purple. Uh, who knows, maybe even that little demoniac girl. <laughs> You know, I got nothing else to do. You <laughs> mind if I come to church? Who knows what took place in that, in that membership? But that's how the Lord builds his church. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You have to be willing to be a servant for that. Yeah. You have to be willing to be a prisoner. You know? I got so many verses about that. Right here, in Galatians 5.13, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Well, that sounds good. I can do what I want. Liberty means I can do what I want. But he says, only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. That means don't use it to do whatever you want. (laughs) That's what he's saying there. He's saying, whatever your flesh is desiring, that's not what your liberty is for. But then he goes on to say, but by love serve one another. See, before, you couldn't serve God out of love. You had to because you were chained. And a lot of people are that way. They're chained to sin to think somehow... Oh, I'm going to do this, God, and you're going to release these chains. He says, no, no, I've released the chains. I don't want you to serve me because you're waiting for me to unlock your locks. I want you to serve me because I've already unlocked your locks. I want you to serve me because you love me, not because you're scared that I'm going to leave you, throw you in hell. Yeah. And that's why these false movements out there are moting, motivating people out of fear of hell to serve God, and it's impossible. That's why these churches never are successful. That's why they say, oh, you know, um, uh, if I told them that that you could be saved and know it, they would have a license to sin. What they're really saying is, if I went and preached that message, I would lose my control over those people. Yeah, but you don't understand. What you would do is you uh, you would help them understand that they're unlocked to serve out of love. I guarantee you, if that's the way you would run your church, you would start seeing love in the church. And now people would love one another, and they'd love God, and they'd start doing things out of, uh, out of a heart for God instead of what you have to. Now you're doing what you get to. Yep. Amen? Oh, do I have to? If you're still in have to, you're, you've got a wrong motivation. Amen? Amen. I know well, for one second thought today, oh, do I have to go to church tonight? That's never on my mind. If that is on your mind, please get right with the Lord. There's something seriously wrong in your heart. There is a sin problem. There's a a bondage issue in your life. And you need to get get that dealt with. Amen? Or you'll never go forward. Because your motivation is not about love. And that's a serious issue. So, another verse, Romans 6, 18 Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. How about this one? 1 Corinthians 9.19, the Apostle Paul, it just really summed up uh, his his heart. For though I be free from all men, 
Yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Wow. See, this is the thing. Uh, I know there's people sometimes when, when we do something and in their heart they're saying, yeah, I should maybe help. But then they wait to see if somebody else is going to do it. See, you call that a non-committal person. A non-committal person doesn't, when you put the sign-up sheet in the back, they don't sign up the first day. They wait till the last minute. You get that. That's someone that's not committed. <laughs> when there's something available for you to do, a person that has made themselves a servant is the first name on the sheet. I'll tell you that right now from my experience as a pastor. <laughs> do you get that? Well, pastor, you know, I I'm planning on going, but we're going to have to see how things go. Don't bother telling me that. I don't want to hear it because you may just be lying to me and don't make yourself a liar. I mean, have enough respect for me that you don't lie to me. I'd rather you just not say anything than lie, <laughs> you know? Go off in your carnality, go off in your complacency, do whatever you want. You're at liberty to do whatever you want to do. Don't lie to people to prove, somehow put yourself in a place that, I'm really, bet, you know, <laughs> I'm pretending to be better than I really am. <laughs> Just be what you are. And then, then actually analyze yourself and say, maybe I shouldn't be what I am. Maybe we need to be the first one to sign up. But I'll tell you what the issue is, it's a love problem. Being faithful to the house of God is a love problem. Yeah. really is. <laughs> Well, preacher, you're not that great a preacher. Well, don't just come for me. Come for the people. Yeah. It's amazing what you did when you loved your girlfriend. <laughs> you know, that, that became your wife. You sw the, aren't there songs where you s swim the widest sea, climb the highest mountain? It's amazing what love will do. You know, if we truly loved one another here, <laughs> your, your life would become secondary to the needs of other people. And that's why the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave. <laughs> Jesus, his own life became secondary to you. <laughs> Amen? And that's the example that we have to give to others. Wow. Choosing to be a servant, who thought it? Isn't it amazing, though, that the world that we're living in right now is attacking that with such great uh, ferocity you know, about the servant master thing and all servitude. Uh, it, you know, ladies in the home, they make you feel so bad that you listen to your husband. You ought not have to listen to him. You're important too. You're significant. And they make it a matter of significance. That somehow it's an importance issue. All you have to do is look at the father and look at the son. And the son just says, whatsoever I hear, that's what I judge. I do nothing of myself. He says, the works of my father, that's what I do. Yeah. The works of my father. So, ladies, all you say, I just do the works of my husband, which is in all reality the works of my heavenly father, because I'm doing this as unto the Lord, as a servant of God, not a servant of men, you see. That, that way, when someone down here tells you to do something that goes against God, you say, no, I can't do that. I love you, but I can't do that. Because I have a greater master. <laughs> Amen. And by the way, the Lord has a uh, covering like this that includes all of his protection over everybody that stays underneath his commands and his will for your life. The husband, the wife, the children. We can all stay under that great umbrella, that great protection. But let's say a husband says, well, I want to go drinking and I want to go to the social and take you with me, wife. And, and they start taking a little part of their life outside of that umbrella. You've got every right to say, I'm staying underneath God's protection. I had someone, oh, I want to go there. It's a little bit too heavy. The Bible says in Romans 6, 22, it says, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, 
ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. That's the benefit of becoming a servant. Amen? What happens if you don't want to be a servant? Well, you'll end up being entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Everybody is like that. You, you will serve somebody. <laughs> you'll either serve God or you'll think you're serving yourself, but in all reality you aren't because your flesh is subservient to his ally, and that is Satan in this world. The Bible says that we walked according to the flesh, according to the prince of the power of the air. The devil has a unique influence over our flesh. He knows exactly how it works. He knows how to, how to feed it. He knows how to make it grow. He has is, he is devised the whole platform of this earth so that your flesh can become strong. That's why any Christian that's doing right, that turns around and goes against it, <laughs> becomes such a sore thumb sticking out. We don't like that. We want everybody just like us. And, but I'm sorry. You're either walking the course or you're walking against the course. Amen? I hope you're walking against it. Because <laughs> if you are, then you've made yourself a servant as unto the Lord. You get, you get what I'm saying here with this whole thing? And so uh, this aspect of servitude, just so important for us to understand as we look in the scriptures, it just really ties hand in hand throughout the whole scriptures. You can see those principles being revealed. And I understand there's bad masters. I understand that even then the Lord says, subject yourselves unto your masters, unto the good, and also unto the froward. So the Lord says, just because a person has a bad attitude and just has a... Uh, you know, a harsh way of dealing with things doesn't mean you always have to disobey and run away. Sometimes the Lord wants you to be underneath that kind of leadership. It doesn't mean you disobey. If he wants you to cheat, he wants you to steal, he wants you to do something as a, as a servant, as an employee, you say no, <laughs> you know. But that's a scary thing because this guy's already off the rocker half the time. Now you're not going to do what he's asked you to do. You say No. Let him let you go then. <laughs> Don't always be the one running. You know, we get, we're, we're no better than the world sometimes. They're just offended at everything. They're, they're canceling everybody, you know. We have to learn to deal with offenses. And we have to learn to take a hit. See, that's where the grace of God shines out. It's when, you're, when that treasure is in an earthen ves vessel and someone takes a, a, a hard uh, instrument and whacks it, and it cracks the clay. And out of that clay shines the light. That's what happens. That's where they see Christ, you see. So if you want to live your whole life having nobody say anything mean to you, you're so tender, <laughs> you'll never be a true servant of God. The Apostle Paul, look at what he went through, you know. He, you think he got a, could have got offended at that jailer? Who do you think you are? But it's not that he was a pushover either because after that was all said and done and he went to the jailer's house, led his family to Christ, baptized all of them that night. They took care of him, dressed his wounds. They went back to the jail. Because Paul says, I don't want this guy to have to face the leadership because I escaped and him being killed because that's what would happen. So he went there, and, he, and they said, oh, we found out you're a Roman citizen. You can go. He says, uh-oh. He says, there has to be an accounting for this. You've just broke the law by doing what you did to a Roman citizen. Because they didn't think that he was a Roman citizen. <laughs> and you got, when you're a Roman citizen, you had very strong rights that you could hold on to. So... In the world that we live in today, I know some people say, oh yeah, you just do whatever, you just let them walk over. No, even the Apostle Paul knew that when something was nailed down by the government in a constitution, in, a, in the rights or whatever it is, that you had every right to stand on those things. Do you get that? He stood on the fact that he was a Roman citizen and he would not leave until he had the head guy come down and get that right. <laughs> that helps you with COVID a little bit. <laughs> you know?
You understand? So the Constitution is supposed to govern our government. <laughs> right? So you get one guy going off base here, and now everybody's just supposed to forsake the, the rights of the citizen? You don't learn that from Scripture. I'm not saying it to do it either, to somehow do it for your own benefit. In fact, I think mostly what he was doing that for was for the jailer. So that they would just sweep it under the rug. Okay, you just go back to your job now. <laughs> you know, everything's good. Let's put the gates back on them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and let Paul go. God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? <laughs> Anyways, letter D and will be done is f uh, female slaves were to be protected. And so it go goes on to talk about if a man sell his daughter to be a ma maidservant. So here you have that aspect where a father that, that um, doesn't have food, doesn't have a way of means to take care of his family, would have to sometimes sell his children for service to masters. So I would never do that. <laughs> you, you don't live in those days. You could just go and get unemployment insurance. You can go and get welfare. You can have a Canadian government pay you and you can sit on your behind all day long. That's not how it was back then. Even in prison, nobody fed you there. You didn't have somebody that loved you and give you food through the bars. You'd starve to death. There were no such things. Programs. You know, we're so socialistic in our, mind th in our mindset today. And so it says, she shall not go out as the men's servants do. And so this whole thing about just letting them go and saying, get out of here, God says no. See, the ladies that are underneath your care, you don't just say, go and fend for yourself. And so many times these, these ladies would become the wives of either the master or the master's sons or so forth. And that was expected almost, ultimately, you see. And so, so anyways, the whole mindset there is, God treats women different than men because he knows that you're under, you need to be protected. And even in his laws about slavery, he put things in there to protect you. <laughs> you know, Now, you'll never have to worry about that type of thing, but it does teach you that there is a difference. And so this whole feminist attitude today, I'm sorry, that is not even scriptural. That has nothing to do with what God says. And that's why when it comes to marriage, uh, you walk down the aisle, the father takes that daughter and gives her over to that young man. And that young man takes her and says, now you're underneath my care. Never is there a moment that daughter is without authority to protect her. And that's what we try to uphold when we look at marriage and, and helping marriages succeed. Yeah. You see? And I know there's a lot of situations where that's already messed up, and now you've got to find a way to bring them under protection. Many times a single lady that's out there with no protection, it's very difficult for them. And so what they would do today, they come into a local church, and they put themselves underneath the protection of God's people. Yeah. And that's the way it ought to be. Right? <laughs> because you are always underneath someone's care. And that always ought to be. And we always got to take care of the ladies in our church. Amen? And if they don't have a husband, we give special care. We make sure they have what they need, and we take care of them. Widows, so forth, that's what we do. Amen? The Bible talks about that. That's what the whole argument was in the book of Acts. Wasn't it? Where the, the widows felt neglected. <laughs> and they fixed it. And so... Just, a, just an important thing I think is a good thing for us to just important thing I think is a good thing for us to just think about the way the Lord lays out these civil laws. He's considering all these things. You know, he really cares and he makes sure that everybody is being taken care of in the children of Israel. Amen. All right. Let's bow our heads.